Okay, hopefully you're connecting and you can hear me. I can see the numbers kind of creeping up and I'm keen to not let it be too kind of draining as we know the cost of living crisis can be, um, we're hearing about it all the time and I want to really provide you with some practical tips and things that you can do now to try and um, save you some money and feel like you're in control of what can be quite a difficult situation. So if you don't know who I am, I'm Philippa, I'm Senior Project Officer at Beacon. So if you don't know who uh, Beacon are, here's a tiny bit about what we do. Our mission um, really centres around this idea that no one should face their rare disease journey alone. This is because there's loads of um, challenges associated with living with a rare disease, whether it's the diagnostic odyssey, the lack of treatments, or the way that having a rare disease actually impacts day-to-day -day living in terms of employment and things like that. Uh, our work falls into these three buckets, which is patient group training, so that's supporting patient groups such as yourselves to form, grow and professionalise, empowering patient groups to provide emotional and practical support to communities, allowing patient groups to feel that they can get involved with research and helping to put patient groups at the heart of research, and also facilitating connections across the Red Seas community. Um, so today's webinar is going to be exploring the impact of the cost of living crisis, and how it, especially it's impacting small organizations. Uh, we're gonna be looking a little bit how you min minimize tech costs, as we know that's been something that's been talked about a lot recently. I'm gonna be giving you some top tips for that. I'm in no way an expert on that. So I really want to use these tips to kind of encourage you to go and do some research on what fits you, but we're always available by email if you have any questions. And Mary Rose, our Chief Operations Officer is really good with things like that as well. So she can help you out. How um, the funding landscape is changing and how different funders are kind of reacting to the cost of living crisis. How to work with existing funders and where you can find uh, funding now. So today we have myself, we have Laura, who is our senior corporate fundraiser, who's going to be doing a little bit about where and how to access funding now. And then David, who is the lead trader at the FSI, who you should also be able to see in the webinar. So I'm going to dive straight in um, with a little bit about the cost of living crisis and what um, experts think is going to happen in terms of how it impacts small organisations. So um, this is from the Char Charity Excellence Framework, and they've been kind of doing a monthly forecast of the cost of living crisis. Um, and that's supposed to really help charities understand what's going on and how that actually impacts them. Because I think we know what's going on in the general wider world, we hear about it all the time, but how actually they think it's gonna impact more widely. So they said that they think the crisis will be both deeper and longer than COVID, primarily due to a huge funding gap made worse by inflation, driving costs and eating into the real value of income. And also there's a surge in demand and increasing people challenges. Now I've put this in bold at the bottom because I think what we've seen in terms of our community is that actually this is fun, this is posing a bigger challenge for those larger organisations who have a lot of staff, who have a lot of operations, who maybe work on the front lines, whereas some of the smaller charities who don't have that office space yet, who don't have those staffing levels yet, have kind of felt that it hasn't been as kind of hard hitting. And I thought I'd put that there just as a reminder, and I think Dave is going to uh, kind of touch on this later, that this is something that we might have to get used to living with, but we've also got used to living with other things in the past. And the charity sector is a very resilient sector to deal with these challenges. So um, it's not something that is going to kind of come and go, but we can get used to it, we can learn how to live with it, and we can build that resilience, which we're going to be talking about today and in the next webinar as well. So some of the main challenges and concerns for charities are the following. Um, some of you might have seen an increased demand of services, whether you're actually giving services on the front lines, which a lot of us aren't, but whether people are looking for more support from patient organisations in terms of mental health, in terms of finding that community. There seems to be an increased demand for that level of support, which can be really difficult to provide if you're kind of a one person voluntary organisation. Um, there's, there might be um, a difficulty in attracting and retaining staff because it, the cost of living crisis is making it more difficult to attract these staff and volunteers. People need to maybe work more. They have less spare time outside of work if they're volunteering. And this might especially be in areas where the cost of living is higher. Um, this can then impact kind of the quality of services. Uh, the cost of living can also put financial pressure on charities. We're going to hear a bit more about this from David later, but um, the way that donors and funders have been reacting to the crisis varies. Um, 
and it means that it can be difficult to know when and where and how to get access to that funding, um, which can make it kind of uncertain and bring a lot of anxiety around where the next funding is going to come from. And then, of course, there's an increased competition for resources, which we all know anyway, that we feel that we're kind of, we know we're in competition for different bids. We know that we have lots of different people to kind of come up against when trying to get money. And I think that that's kind of been exacerbated a little bit or feels exacerbated in the current circumstances. So I've put here, it's not all bad news. As I said earlier, we're all used to kind of living in these tough times. And often the tribe sector is more resilient and, and can be more dynamic, actually. And David's going to talk a lot more about that later. This is also from the um, Charity Excellence Framework forecast, where they're expecting inflation to fall soon. They're expecting that the deterioration of fundraising that began after COVID is slowing down. And also they're expecting some, some signs of recovery a little bit earlier on. But obviously it's really difficult for them to predict exactly what's going to happen in terms of this. Um, and also there's steps you can take to minimise the impact of this crisis and strengthen, strengthen for the future. And there are organisations and resources out there to help you, which hopefully we'll highlight today. I'm just going to really quickly check that this is recording because it should be, yeah, perfect. So um, some top tips for minimising tech costs. As I said, I'm not an expert, but I've kind of been collating this across the board because there's a lot of things out there at the moment if you're subscribing to kind of NTVO and FSI, there's loads of things out there to help you. So I've kind of collated those for you in ways that I think are most helpful to this audience. Uh, so firstly, if you're not already aware of charity digital pricing, definitely check that out because there's loads of um, things out there that act that are actively trying to help nonprofits and are there for you. So on charity digital, you can get loads of um, tools available at discounted rates. I've put some of them here. So you've got Microsoft 365, Zoom, Slack, Adobe. Anything that helps you do your work easier, you can probably find on there for a discounted price. Uh, you can also access Google Workspace for nonprofits, which allows eligible organizations to have discounted rates. There's a Google portal where you can apply for that directly, um, really easily, easy to find that through Google. And if you already use Google Workspace, you can actually log in and see if you're eligible to have that um, discount placed onto your account if you don't already. Another thing that you can do to kind of minimize uh, your costs is to really look at what contracts you're paying for at the moment. It's a really good time to be doing a kind of an audit of what you're paying for and whether you need to be paying for it or not. So a good thing to do is kind of make a list of all of your contracts, look at when they expire, look at what the termination details are, think about what you're using and what you don't need to be using and really kind of get uh, critical with, with that. Think about whether you're paying for services that you don't need whether there's a way to kind of com combine your contracts or fix costs for a period of time and think about whether you're getting the best value for money because there's nothing worse than paying for something that you feel like you're not getting anything back from. Do some research and make sure you're getting competitive rates and also look at what penalties there would be in place if you did need to terminate. And then, of course, across all of this, are you getting the best value for the nonprofit that you could be? Um, you can also work on power saving. We've been hearing a lot about this in terms of our personal lives, you know, turning off the heating, turning off the lights, all of that kind of stuff. You can use cloud servers um, instead of premise servers, which I'm sure a lot of you already do because you might not have office spaces. Look at the individual power settings on your PCs to make sure that they're as efficient as possible and try and utilize hybrid working. I know some of you guys do have office spaces. So have a schedule so it shuts down when nobody is in the office. So you can just kind of shut everything down and save on electricity and costs. You can also explore renting not only computers, but other types of office equipment if you want to, because um, it means that you don't need to um, like you don't need to pay it all at once. So it actually makes it better value in terms of having the latest um, up to date gear, uh, which you can upgrade throughout your rental period. Um, these payments are not affected by inflation and are fixed. That means that you're kind of protected in that way if you do choose to lease or rent a computer, and they often include a warranty and insurance. You can also kind of do an audit of the tech that you use. Um, if you do have an office space and you've got some kind of desktops, do you need those if you've got a laptop? What can you kind of get rid of to save money? And what can you minimize in terms of phone systems and things like that to actually save you money? 
at Beacon, we use Zoom calling now. So we got rid of our traditional phone and we set up an online phone system, which is actually easier because normally you're on your computer anyway, you're on your phone anyway, and the call comes straight through to that instead of having to have a traditional kind of phone line. But obviously that depends on what kind of services you're providing and how integral a phone is to that. There's also some other charity discounts that I've collated here. So ways that you can get access to non um, to mobile phones for nonprofits through Good Call or SwitchAid, and they give really good discounts to nonprofit organisations. I've also put Charity Workers Discount on here. This is something that I use. And if you work for a charity or a patient group, they don't do that many checks, and you can get personal discounts to loads of shops and um, holidays and you know white goods, things like that. And I just think it's really useful um, because it keeps you up to date with ways that you can get money off things for yourself. There's also a lot of free training online. So if you're a bit like me and you don't really know how to use a lot of these things, there's loads of training on how to actually utilize these tools once you've got them. And they're there to help you because you don't have to pay for them. And in terms of things like this, there's loads of webinars out there at the moment about minimizing those tech costs. Um, and loads of people who actually want to help you do that. Um, so you can do a quick Google. NCBO has got quite a few, as I said, and have a look through those and see what's happening. Um, in terms of not cutting costs, it's best to keep your cybersecurity um, as an investment. Um, if your cybersecurity is not up to date, you're going to risk losing money, data and other things as an organisation, which you don't want to lose. So it's really good to invest in that. And it's also good to invest in high spec devices um, as investing in lower quality equipment is actually going to cost you more in the long run. Um, I know that there's some grants and things available to help charities invest in these kinds of things. So you can check those out and make sure you're getting equipment that's going to last and give a um, really high quality output. So I'm going to hand over to Laura now really, um, really quickly. She's going to be talking a little bit about some resources that you can use to find um, funding and some funding pots that we think are quite relevant um, to you guys at the moment. Um, but yeah, sorry about that. I'm Laura. I'm um, the senior corporate fundraiser for Beacon. Um, and I'm just here today to highlight some funding that I've kind of uh, seeked out and a few top tips that might support some of you to uh, look for funding at this at this time. Um, so first I wanted to highlight um, grants portals. Um, so essentially, I don't know, some of you might already be using them, um, but there are a couple of good grant portals out there. One of them is Grants Online. Um, so this actually has a free element to it. Um, so you can actually go on and if you can see on the image below, um, it offers funding categories in areas um, such as the cost of living crisis. It's got health, um, education and training. So you can essentially look for the work that you do um, and see what bids are the latest out there. Um, the free element only allows you to sort of get the names of the bids that are out there and it does stop you searching after a while. If you want to sort of use the resource in more detail, you can look at subscription. They actually offer um, £17 um, just for one month. So you could just access it for a month uh, right through to a year, which is around £125. Um, but again, it is um, available as a free resource. So it's good to have a browse through and just have a look. Um, the second one I was going to highlight was Funds Online. Um, so this is actually created by the Director for Social Change um, and they have a paid subscription at about £410 for a year. Um, so it's obviously quite an investment, uh, which not everybody would need or want to make, um, but it just wanted to make you aware that it is out there and they obviously have access to an extensive amount of um, funders on there. Um, the DSC also produced publications, which can be quite useful. Again, these can range in the price from uh, sort of 50 to 100 pounds, but they're large um, directory books that provide lists of all the trusts and foundations out there. They have corporate guides to corporates that um, offer corporate funding. And they've also started books um, that offer actually the new trusts and foundations that are coming out each year. So trusts and foundations that are recently set up, which is um, a good resource to obviously be aware of because obviously because they're new, they might not have a lot of people accessing their pots so um yeah have a look through if you think they would be useful um it's always good to be aware of um the next thing i wanted to look at today is local funding so um don't know if everybody is aware or accesses it but obviously local and district councils in your area offer funding um you can get small pots of money from your local council for things like events for sort of 300 to 500 pounds and then district councils offer funding for um, in larger pots, so for health and well-being projects in your areas. 
Um, obviously, have a look through your council websites, um, but you can also um, speak to a representative there and, and just make them aware of who you are and what you're doing, because um, if there are pots of money, they, they want to give money to people working in the local area. Um, I would also say contact your local Rotary. Um, so Rotaries obviously raise a lot of money and distribute it um, to causes that they, they see as having value. They regularly um, have speakers at their, at their meetings. Um, it's always good, again, to get in touch with your local Rotary, maybe arrange a time to go in and talk about the work that you do. And just to make them aware of who you are, um, they do a lot of local fundraising as well, where um, they might do um, events throughout the summer or events in the holidays and Christmas, where they'll raise large funds of uh, pots of money and distribute it to other local charities. So, again, if they know who you are, um, they'll make a... They, they might make a donation to what you do. Um, also, when you go in for a talk, they they often give a donation of sort of um, anything up to four hundred pounds. So it's it's just good to be in contact with them. Um, the other thing I wanted to highlight was obviously everybody knows about trusts and foundations mostly, but um, to look at the trusts and foundations that are in your local area. Um, so obviously, trusts and foundations have a wide range of categories that they fund, um, but if you they often also want to fund work that's happening in the area where they're based um so if you just have a you can use google if you're based in cambridge look at cambridge trust and foundations if you're based in another area you look at trust and foundations in that area um and again just get in touch with them and just explain what you do um and see if they if they would you know contribute to the work that you're doing um another important um connection is always your local community foundation um, so there's four, 47 that cover the whole of the UK, and you can actually um, look at that through the link that's in this slide um, and see which communi community foundation is near you. Um, um, so they deal with um, pots of money from local companies. Sorry, my <laughs> voice is scratching a bit there. Um, so building societies, local businesses that have pots of money but just can't um, or don't want to deal with the, the due diligence of checking uh, out who the charities are and what they what they do, um, they will hand their pots of money over to a community foundation who will distribute them appropriately and do all the necessary checks. I'm sorry about my throat. Um, yes, so um, please get in touch with your community foundation and see, even if you can't see through their website, a pot of money that might be suitable for you. Um, you will, um, if you get in touch with them, they might have a thought in their head of what um, funder might be suitable. Um, they also look at shortfall, so they tend to support if you're waiting for a national lottery bid or um, say you applied to a funder and they gave you less than you originally applied for. Um, community foundations are really useful to sort of fill the gaps where you're waiting for more money to come in. So again, just find the representative and speak to them. Um, they're also giving out emergency cost of living grants at the moment. Um, I run a small um, community allotment charity and we were recently awarded £600 as a one-off donation we have received grants from our community foundation and they obviously know who we are now and just wanted to give us um, a one-off donation to help with the cost of living crisis. So please um, get in touch with yours and try and uh, make the connection there. Um, and now I just wanted to highlight a few of the smaller funders that are out there. I have um, found it hard. Um, there, there are um, there aren't as many uh, um, supporting all organisations at the moment. Um, but these are a few that I found um, on grants online, actually. Um, but obviously, you can go on there and yourself and see um, that there's lots more to look through. Um, so one that I found was the Central England um, Cooperative. So they're actually um, closing on the 31st of March. So it'd be good to have a look at them quickly. Um, but they're looking to give around 100 to 5,000 pounds every 12 months to help projects that aim to support access with food, health, well-being, and inclusion. Um, so have a look at them through the website um, on the slide. Um, and then there's the Tesco Community Grants Programme. Um, you can apply for £1,500. Um, you're one of three organisations, so you've probably all seen the blue tokens within the supermarkets. Um, they do tend to have preferential treatment to um, charities working in the local, local community. Um, but they often also have gaps where people aren't applying. So again, get in touch with sort of the community development worker at your local Tesco's, make sure they know who you are and sort of find out if there's an opportunity for you to apply to get in on that. Um, if you've got a good local base um, of supporters, obviously everyone, getting everybody to put those blue tokens in can really get you that money um, at the top end of the 1,500. 
Um, and a couple of other trusts that I've identified in my little search over the last couple of weeks. Um, so there's the Dis Dishma um, Charitable Trust. Um, so uh, they are offering up between £1,000 to £5,000 in education and training um, and to the advancement of health or saving lives and disability. Um, I couldn't find a website for them, but there is an email there that I've included. Um, but I can do a bit more digging if anyone has any problems contacting them. But I'd say email them, find out what their process is and eligibility, um, and obviously send through an application if, if you think it's right for you. Um, another trust and foundation I located that's um, offering small pots right now is 500 to 5,000, which is the Edith Murphy, Murphy Foundation, um, which they focus on providing much needed support to those in care. Um, and they have a direct website. So have a click on there. Um, there are lots more out there, I'm sure. These are just a few of the ones I've identified in doing research for this um, quick section. So, um, yeah, we'll include some in the PDF we send out after the session if we find any more that might be useful. Um, and finally, I just wanted to highlight some of the larger core cost funders, because I know core costs are obviously the most important thing for a lot of organisations. I'm sure most of you are aware of the National Lottery Community Fund. Um, so obviously they have their awards for all. Um, they're continuing to make grants between £300 and £10,000 at the moment, um, and they have lots of streams, but one of them is to assist with challenges caused by the cost of living crisis and the aftermath of COVID-19. Um, so again, you can, the useful thing about awards for all as well is you can go for full staff costs. So for instance, if your project is 20,000 or 15,000, um, but actually you need that 10,000 just for staff costs, you can literally write that on the application. Um, we've done it at Beacon. Um, I know a couple of patient group organizations who've just gone in for awards for all for the full staff costs and received it. So, um, if staff costs is what you're in desperate need of, they could be a really good route to go down and the turnover is fairly quick sometimes. Um, yeah, so uh, get have a look at that if, if that's what you're looking for. Um, and then a few others that obviously maybe you're already aware of, but I thought I'd highlight them just in case. Um, so there's a Henry Smith charity. They have a, a strengthening communities strand uh, where you can look at funding in between 20,000 to 60,000 for, available for three years. Um, and that is... Um, We'll send out the links to that afterwards. Um, there's Garfield Western. Um, something to be aware of with Garfield Western is um, that they want you to have at least half of the funding identified before you apply to them. Um, so it's just something to be aware of so you don't go in um, and spend a lot of time on a bid uh, when you haven't got half of the funding already in place. And they only award uh, up to around 10% of what, of what the total bu budget costs are. So um, if you're looking for more than that, they might not be the one for you. Um, and then there's Esme Fairburn Foundation. Um, so they um, offer unrestricted grants of over 30,000 for up to three years. Um, and they look at um, uh, eligibility in a natural world, a fairer future and creative, confident communities. Um, they also like to um, fund partnership and collaboration projects. So if you are working as a partner with another organisation, it could be a good route to go down. And all of these are continuous rolling programmes. So they're all available ongoing. Um, so, yeah, we will, as I said, be sending out a PDF after this um, webinar and we'll try and include as many links as we can to support you all. So I'm going to hand over to David now, who is the lead trainer at the FSI, and he's going to be um, talking a bit more about what we mentioned earlier, which is kind of funding in these emergency times and uh, how you can kind of approach that on term in terms of an attitude that you take towards working with existing funders and kind of approaching these challenges. Thanks very much, Thanks. Um, folks. Um, yeah, I actually pick up on a few of the things that we've talked about. Um, let's do some intros first, shall we? So my name is, as you can see on the screen, is David Page. Uh, that's my Sunday name. I usually go by Dave. Um, and I work for the Foundation for Social Improvement, but that's a bit of a mouthful, so we go by the FSI. We're a small charity ourselves that exists to train, to upskill um, organisations like you, other small charitable organisations in some key areas of operations like fundraising and strategy and governance and impact is our other big one, measure and impact. Um, so today we're going to be talking about, as Phil's just said, about what we can do with um, fundraising in tough or uncertain economic times. Um, and it's best to look at it as a single big 
actual challenge that we're working through. Now, I'm speaking from a place of experience. I um, just wrote down the financial crashes that I've been a fundraiser through, and that was 2008, 2010, 2016, 2020, and the one that we've got now. So that's the kind of place of experience I'm talking from. So let me just share my screen. Um, and we can go through this together. So what I thought would be nice to do is for us to start with the good news. And the biggest lesson that I've learned is that we need to just do that thing of keeping calm and carry on. Because you see, we always live in, a, in tough economic times. Every day, of every week, of every year, thousands of people, many of whom we know, experience themselves being thrown in to tough economic times in their own lives. People lose their jobs. People need to access private medical care because the NHS can't provide what they need. People who maybe make bad business decisions and struggle with that, or maybe they enter the, uh, you know, they get to the end of their credit line. These people quite often are our staff, folks that we work with, they're our volunteers. And they're also our service users or our service users' families. And the same can be said for charities. Every week, people stop giving regularly to charities or stop their volunteering efforts. They stop fundraising. Um, every week, charities have declined from funding bids that would really have uh, achieved a lot if they had been granted. And actually, so quite a lot of charities actually wind up altogether. Five and a half thousand charities uh, ended, uh, wound up uh, in 2022, which is quite a horrible number, isn't it? But as a sector, we deal with these tough economic times constantly. I mean, when was the last time that you heard of an organisation that could take its foot off the gas from fundraising because they met all of the needs that are out there that they wish to meet? The answer is never and so it's at the start of the session it's it's important to enter this with a kind of optimistic mindset of actually we've been through this before maybe not your specific organization but as a charitable kind of ethos of the united kingdom we've been here many many times before and there is experience there of holding on getting through and focusing on actually flourishing in tough economic times on a personal level, um, and sometimes it doesn't feel like that, but on a personal level, as was mentioned earlier, the charitable sector is actually the safest place to work in times of tough economic uh, challenges. Um, because people really value charities and they understand that the work of charities, um, you know, the work that they do is really important. And there was a recent study that showed that people are much more likely to cancel their Netflix subscription than they are to their regular charity donation that's going out. Um, we're not a luxury, even though sometimes we think we might be. So it's kind of with this positive front foot forward approach that we want to head into this quick session with confidence that actually we are going to make it through. And it's going to be hard. And yes, there's going to be some tough decisions that we have to make. And there will be some charity casualties as well. But for those of us who are prepared, who are well informed about how we can approach this, hopefully we can minimise those numbers. Um, but I guess, I mean, I'm going to just ask a rhetorical question because we're not in a meeting format on Zoom today. But I just wonder if actually you've noticed income has dropped as a result of this economic turndown that we've gone through. Um, I know that for most charities who are small, the answer is no, not yet. Um, so that's good news. But actually, we need to think of the bad news, because if you haven't noticed this drop in income, you might think that oh, we don't really need to worry about this. We're too small. We're going to fly under the radar and be fine. But that's not a helpful mindset. You need to be aware of this challenge and you're going to have to do work to get around this challenge. Because the financial um, troubles that we're in at the moment doesn't actually relate to money. It's not that there's a lack of money there. The money is there. What isn't there? is confidence and society as a whole because of the financial troubles 
has lost confidence. And so I did a bit of digging into the psychology of all of this. And I mean, it's quite obvious when you put it together, because if confidence is the root of all of this um, challenge that we're going through, um, confidence affects people's attitudes, doesn't it? And therefore it affects their giving because giving is an attitude, a life attitude. So people with less confidence in their finances are going to be less confident to give their money away. But also that lack of confidence leaches into other parts of life. As we're not kind of, you know, compartmentalized robots who can just block off different aspects of our life. We're kind of these strange biological beings, aren't we? And so their desire maybe to give their time is going to be affected or they've got this increased as it says on the slide here this increased anxiety this worry which i think actually is a hangover from the health worries that we had coming through covid and you think about worry and anxiety that's going to affect volunteering isn't it lower motivations um less resilience some of us will be working with really fragile service users and fragile family un units that are really struggling in life and if those that resilience is dropping then that's going to be a problem that we need to consider thinning relationships as well it's it, these, these issues add up now we're putting this in the frame today of just talking about finances and actually that's right for this session but you just need to be aware even if your finances haven't been imp impacted there's going to be deeper impacts um to those you work with um and those who support you um in just finances so that's kind of the bad news but let's uh, let's go and shift on to uh, a bit more good news and what we can do to proactively look um at being resilient and building up our sustainability in this time so let's go and talk about grant makers. For most small uh, charities, include and uh, actually, especially for small uh, charities who operate under the banner of a health cause, um, grant makers are significant funders. That's probably not news to you. Um, and from my experience of what I've seen working with small charities as a trainer and as a consultant over the past number of years is that these grant makers kind of fall into two categories. You've got your old fashioned ones who don't really want to change what they're doing. They tend to be the smaller grant makers, um, those who don't have teams uh, of people employed to dish out their grants. Um, maybe uh, or quite often, actually, they're those that are administered by, administered by solicitors. And you can tell that because you're usually writing to an address of a solicitor when you're writing an application to them. Um, and with them, they don't change. It's kind of just like business as usual. They might have reacted slightly to COVID because everybody was. And even though now they're being encouraged to react again, they're not going to do it. Those are folks that we have to deal with. But then there are others who do understand and they do have a desire to make applying easier, to make the turnaround times quicker and ensure that feedback is more appropriate to the capacities that we have to provide feedback. But as they're doing this, they need to also kind of balance it out to maintain the quality of their giving, which is actually really hard for them to do. So I do have a bit of sympathy for these people who have got deep pockets and exist to give their money away. Um, however, despite the um, Association of Charitable Foundations, which is like their governing body, um, urging, there's not a surge in increasing grant giving as we saw with COVID, there's maybe a little bit going on with the bigger ones, as uh, Laura's just told us, um, but there's not much going on as a society as a whole. What they are doing, those who are changing though, if they can't give more, then being suggested to alter their priorities. And this is pretty fresh and hot off the press. So watch this develop over the next 12 months or so, because they're being, um, encouraged to provide more core funding which as somebody who works for a small charity is music to my ears um 
they're also being encouraged to pay more attention to how organizations look after their staff or look after their key um, key volunteers. So if you do have a staff uh, member that's being employed and you're not giving them a cost of, or you're not budgeting a cost of living wage increase for them, that's going to start to be negatively reflected, which is brilliant because it allows us to just be more transparent about the actual costs of what we deliver because sometimes we tend to hide them and make them seem a bit less so the grant's going to seem like it achieves a bit more i'm sure you don't do that that must just be me um and they're also um being uh, uh being encouraged to enhance the clarity and cl collaboration that they have with other funders and also with grantees so the pe people like us who receive grants from these organizations and when that clarity is there that means they're going to have more ownership they're going to they're going to share in your successes they're going to share in your challenges as well um, and that kind of deepens the relationship and that's a really nice thing um, for sustainability so they're really positive but as i said that's pretty early doors so hopefully that will continue to develop and grow over the next year maybe three years five years financially though the majority of trusts are sitting quite pretty, quite fine. They're not experiencing the same issues that the rest of us are. Um, that's because the majority of them are either fueled by the stock market and the stock market in the UK, both the FTSE 100 and the FTSE 250, um, are doing really well. The FTSE 100 is actually at an all-time high at the moment. It's never been richer is another way of terming that. Whilst the 250, it has been higher in the past, but we're now back to pre-pandemic levels. Um, and other significant markets that they might generate their funds from around the world are all doing pretty well as well. So they're sitting OK. They also get their money um, from property. And anybody who has thought about moving house or trying to rent a, a place to live recently will know that the property market is doing just fine as well in the UK. So the grant levels are not likely to fall and hopefully they'll slowly and gradually increase over the next uh, over the years as well. Though the UK is not doing well compared to other countries, but that's political. We'll ignore that. The problem that we have, though, which, you know, is increasing costs. And we said I said, you know, a little moment ago about that aspect of um, funders being encouraged to be clear to be more transparent. And the biggest tool in our chest that we have is not hiding these increasing costs from funders. You can talk to funders directly. Well, I should rephrase that. You can talk to some funders directly, you know, those who actually want to hear from you. Um, many don't. Um, but the biggest, um, biggest thing you can do is be honest and transparent in your applications and reflect these increasing costs. Because if you do it, or if you all do it, then that's going to show the accurate picture of what's actually happening with small charities. Um, and that's what funders need to know. That's the way that we tell them. That's the power we have. It's kind of like a union that we have with the funders saying, actually, no, you do need to be increasing the amounts that you give or specifying more clearly where you want your money to go so it'll achieve your outcomes. Um, you can also use your feedback to those who have, uh, you've been successful with grants from already whether it be a big £10,000 grant or whether it just be, a, you know, like a small 250 £500 grant, you can feed back and say, this is brilliant, but it's not been able to achieve what we expected it to achieve because everything's 10% more expensive now, 12% more expensive now. Um, and so in that feedback, you can also paint that picture of the reality of what we're operating in. And it's important that we do focus on that um, uh, focus on that transparency and painting that accurate picture so they understand what's going on. So that's kind of like the landscape of grant makers there. Um, and yeah, we talked, there was a, you know, Laura mentioned the lottery. The lottery is, you know, a six month turnaround. So that's a long term funding, um, long term funding option. You've got Garfield West, and I think they're on a, a they're on a eight week. Um, so that's between two and four months, actually, is what they described is their turnaround time. So the bigger grant, bigger funders that do do these core grants take time. 
Um, so looking for um, those little grants that can keep you going until the big ones come in is really important. I had something else to say on trust and foundations, but I can't remember what it was. I'll put in a couple of other sources that you can go and explore um, in the webinar chat as well. I should also just say that if you do have questions, do pop them in the question and answer box. And if you have all have that open, then you can have a look and vote for the ones um, that you would like uh, to be answered um, at the end of the session. So let's go and have a look at um, what you can do yourselves away from grant funding um, to be more resilient to be sustainable as organizations. Now these principles are, or are as applicable to a community group that does a bit of fundraising for themselves through to, you know, Oxfam or Tier Fund or the absolute giant ones. Um, so you can apply them to yourselves um, in the context and the funding context that you're operating. Now the first one and the biggest one, because it's also the easiest one, is keep what you have. It is far easier to retain a funder or a donor, and it is far cheaper to retain or uh, to a funder or a donor than it is to find the replacement one. And that's because fundraising all works on relationships. Now with grant uh, providers, some of the bigger ones are cutting that out in an attempt for fairness, but with just about everybody else, it's all about relationships and your fundraisers who are maybe running your bake sales for you and things like that. People who maybe want to give to you every month or maybe they'll provide a gift every year. That invitation to the Rotary Club to speak once a year and they do a collection for you. That's all based on relationships. So what you need to do is think about how you can build these relationships. So I wonder when was the last time somebody um, you, you just sent a thank you to a donor or somebody who's given you some money um, at a completely random time, not just after they've made a gift or a follow up email for the last um, for the for the funding that came in to say, thank you so much for this gift you made six months ago. This is what we've achieved so far. We would love to report to you uh, on what else it's going to be achieving uh, in another six months time. When was the last time you had like a case study that you collected, a really nice story that you just shared with people without actually asking them for any more money? Um, if you are falling in the majority of charities, the answer is oh, we just haven't really done that. If you have done that kind of thing, kudos to you. Well done. But you can take that a bit further. When was the last time you actually sent them a physical gift? Um, sent them a card through the post that wasn't just a Christmas card that everybody cha every charity does. Valentine's card, maybe, if that was appropriate. Um, I once worked with a youth work organisation, I'm up in Glasgow, and it was a Scottish uh, charity. Um, working across Scotland and we took children away on residential trips is what we did um, and some of those kids um, really liked art some of them didn't so when it came to the creative activities and draw, making paintings and stuff I said to the ones some of the ones that didn't want to keep their artwork because they weren't pleased with it um, could you just put your initials on the bottom and can I have it and I sent it to some of the people who had given us money so that we could run that week of respite. I don't know your situation, so that, that idea might be completely um, inappropriate for you. Um, however, maybe something like that, a cheap little gift that comes from your service users can go a long, long way. But then just think about your general communication tone. At the moment, we're, there's panic everywhere about money. So what if the next message you send wasn't a panicked, we need money kind of communication, but rather a thank you for giving previously and keeping on giving communication or a communication that just celebrated what you do rather than have that panic emergency funding time. Now we call all of this kind of relation building um, 
exercises and it's not just communications i mean inviting people for a tour going taking people out for a coffee recording a video and sending it to them that kind of stuff we call all of this stewardship and stewardship is the process that is key to retention and that's what you want to do when you keep your existing regular donors your major donors your fundraisers your volunteers your trust relationships as it all says on this slide here and if that's something that tickles your fancy and you think that um, is particularly relevant for you, the FSI has got training on that, um, which we'll be happy to deliver. We'll talk to the guys at Beacon. Maybe we could work out some kind of partnership together. So that's the first thing that I wanted to talk about today is keeping what you have. The second bit is about diversification. Basically, not having all your eggs in one basket. Now, in my experience with um, small health related charities that um, pie chart that's on the left there typically is how they fund themselves loads of grants and some council contracts or NHS contracts as well keeps them going and that seems to be the pattern up to when charities have got two and a half three four million pounds of income uh, right the way down to tiny niche groups probably like yourselves but that's not a very healthy way of being because what if that nhs grant that makes up a quarter of your income stops because the nhs runs out of money for that particular thing or what if that grant provider comes to the end of the three-year period and actually says right you cannot now apply for another two years which is not unusual then you've got a big hole and a big panic that you need to fill so you look at diversifying and that means just mixing up your different sources of income. Now, there's lots of different places that you can get income from. So asking people um, to give you a, a donation every month might seem really scary, but I've seen charities, um, even before they're officially registered, engaging with other interest groups and interested people and getting money. Uh, I helped launch a charity up here in Glasgow. Um, and by the time we we're officially launched, we we're already getting £350 a month in um, from people who wanted to support the charity because they just got it straight away. Asking other people, seeing if people will do the fundraisers for you. We'll do, you know, a big run up a hill or something active that these people like. Or they'll do something, a sponsored silence or a sponsored read. I had friends who did a 24-hour dance-a-thon and I just left them to that. But they loved it and they they raised about £1,500 from that. Um, and mixing it up. And that's really important to do. Um, but you don't just want to try doing everything. Have a figure out which one of them is going to be the easiest for you to do. If you have a wide social network, then probably asking people to give or asking people to do fundraising or inviting them to some event that you're running is going to be a lot easier for you. And that's a good idea to explore that. If you don't have a large um, social circle, maybe you've got family members who um, work in local businesses and you could explore that and see if there's any option for partnership there as well. Um, then they've got earned income. And earned income, we're going to go and talk about in a little minute. So I'm just going to leave that there hanging, uh, as it were. So we've got here how to diversify. There's two different ways of coming at it. And I'm going to go um, quite quickly through this, I think. So the first way of looking at it is looking at those different streams of income, which in themselves are pretty sustainable. Um, so you've got regular giving at the top of the slide here. That's actually the nirvana of sustainability. Think about it. You've got four major donors, for example, who support you. Let's say they give you uh, £2,500 a month each. So you bring in £10,000 in total. If one of those stops giving, you've got a massive gap, a quarter of your income you've got. But if you've got 100 people who give you less um, each month, um, but still it totals up to that £10,000. If one of them stops giving, you've still got 99 people supporting. That's why it's the nirvana of sustainability. And I encourage all charities to consider um, regular giving. Um, it doesn't have to be direct debit, it can be a 
more ad hoc, more amateur than that, that's fine if you're small. It doesn't have to be a polished program, but just that awareness that people could support you that way and quite often would like to, especially if you are small, um, then that's brilliant. You've got your own friends, your own family who might want to do it because they want to invest in something that you love and you care about. And for some of you, it might be appropriate with your service users or their families or ex-service users and their families, maybe. Um, there's potential out there. The problem with regular giving is it takes a long time to build up. The quickest I've ever seen somebody build up a regular giving program is actually 18 months. So it's not emergency fundraising, it's strategic fundraising. Usually it takes closer to three years to become a serious source of income for you where you are now, um, where you are, you can step back and say, brilliant, that's, that's much more sustainable. And the other good thing about regular giving is quite often, you can use it for however you want. It's core costs, it's free. Sometimes it gets restricted, but usually you can use it forever the heck you want. And that's great. Now the next um, stream of income that just lends itself to sustainability is earned income. And that's the income that you earn through just what you do. It doesn't need to cover all the costs of what you do, but if it's generating some income, it's earned income. And that's sustainable because as long as you're doing your activities, then you're going to be generating this income. But then there's the, the barrier to it, excuse me, which is we don't want to make things too expensive so people can't access our um our, our our activities that we do we don't want people to be priced out of our assistance and help so there is there's a line there there's that you know that needs to be trod. but earned income isn't just generating money from those people who you exist to support um you want to look at it in three different ways um so obviously your activities that's the first one which we just talked about also think about what skills you've got on your staff team are there any opportunities that you could share those skills and charge for it? Um, I'm working one of my client consultancy clients at the moment is a counselling charity, and they offer counselling packages to the businesses uh, within the area of their office um, as like a staff benefit, and they generate income by doing that. Um, another charity I've just finished working with them, actually, um, they uh, refugee and asylum seekers are the groups that they supported, but they had an office and they didn't use all the office anymore because people were working from home. So they rented out some of the rooms and there are costs associated with that, but they did their diligence and charged the right amounts and that generated income for them. So that's your assets. So you want to look at your activities, your people and the skills that you've got around you and your assets as well. And that's a good way of thinking about how you can maybe generate some earned income. And then you look at those areas of life um, and those streams of fundraising, which are just naturally resilient. You know, we've just said that Trust and Foundations um, are pretty secure financially because of where their income comes from. Um, they're fueled from the wealthy. Major donors, they tend to be affluent and wealthy as well. Not always like super rich, I mean, but you know we're talking head teachers doctors folks like that who could give you uh, wonderful uh, wonderful uh, levels of giving but need to be cultivated to the point they're going to be least affected usually um by economic flux because they've got money in the bank they've got money in their savings accounts they've got investments that they can use to maintain their standards of life um and so you can look at approaching and diversifying to them and then the bottom one is corporates, which is interesting because we hear stories about companies that um, re are really struggling and need government bailouts and things like that as well. But actually, there's a huge social benefit and promotional benefit for companies to partner with one or more charities and i'm not just talking about you know tesco and asda and all that um, i'm talking about your local estate agents maybe your, your, the accountants that's down the road maybe even the butchers or something on the high street if you're still lucky enough to have a butchers on your high street um because the people want to buy products from companies that are seen to have a positive effect on society 
Um, some folks just want the cheapest thing that's out there. Fair enough, that's probably not going to change. But there's an upswelling and a, a change in uh, social trends, which is driven by those under the age of 40, um, to engage more with companies who do have these social credentials. And there's no easier way for a company to just gain a boost than to partner with a charity. So while the narrative in the news is that companies are struggling, a strategic option for them might be to try and explore and exploit the social credentials um, and actually give you donations, give you volunteers to help you um, thrive and flourish if they can use your name um, to help build their business. So that's kind of a very quick snapshot on how to diversify. Actually, the session yesterday, um, it was three hours we were focusing on diversification and I could have carried on for another two. So it is a big topic. Um, and if you do want help uh, in considering anything like that, please do reach out to Beacon, reach out to us at the FSI um, and we can see what we can find for you. And then the final one, our final point, and we'll just cover this and then we'll go to a little Q&A session afterwards. So if you do have questions, um, pop them in that question and answer box rather than in the chat box um because well, i won't see those um the final point is peer support i mean you're all on this call together you're all kind of uniting under this banner of of beacon um so talk to each other share successes that you've had that might enable others to see success as well um if something has been particularly inspiring for you and you want to share it find someone and share it connect with each other an encouraging phone call in the small charity world can really do wonders. Grabbing a cup of coffee with somebody, if there's, uh, you know, another organisation that's in the same kind of area, is even better. Um, online communities do have their place, but that physical connection of somebody actually dialing and talking to you or sitting across from someone in a coffee shop um, is fantastic. Uh, I got a request from a guy um, I quite like impact measurement um, and I know my stuff around impact measurement because I've done it for so many years um, and um, on the same day I got a request from a small charity saying can you help us with our impact measurement um, but we also got a, um, a LinkedIn uh, connection from a guy who's doing a master's in impact measurement and wanted to interview me I was flattered by both of those because what they just showed that they were interested in what I had to say. So connect with each other, share ideas, um, and also possibly explore the idea of taking it a bit further. Consider collaboration. Maybe there's an event that if you're working uh, with a similar organization, maybe you could do an event together, either in a local park if you're near enough, or maybe something online, maybe an online information session, maybe an online cheese and wine night, something like that that can generate funds for you or give you a bit of inspiration of working together. Maybe even you can share an office space or buy in bulk or something like that. But again, that leads into the geographic, and I know today we are spread around the country. So that's a quick, super quick overview of what you can look at doing um, to help increase your sustainability, increase your resilience as an organization to get through um, these financially challenging times. Um, but also just to be aware that it's not just finances that are going to be impacted by this. It's the overall confidence of the population. And so just keep an eye out for other areas where maybe you're suffering and you need to pay a bit attention so um that's the end of uh, my little presentation so we can go to a q and a time just now i would just like to say um picking up on the saving um uh, on the saving money for your it bits that phil talked about earlier um the fsi we've got a, a an arrangement with charity digital that if you subscribe to the fsi we've got a subscription um package you get uh, fast tracked through the charity digital process, which can take a wee while to get going. Um, so um, that's twenty pound a month. You get free access to all of our training. I saw a question in the chat just pop up there, which was saying, "Where can I get from uh, training or information on how to measure impact?" Come to us. We've got um, short and full day courses on impact measurement that we can um, 
we can uh, sort out for you um, and deliver um, as a cohort to make it nice and cheap and accessible. Well, in fact, it's free, sorry, if you're a subscriber. If you're not free, it's uh, between 15 and 50 pounds um, to come on our training courses. So it's still quite affordable, but there we go. So any questions that anybody would like to pop in the Q and A box. Um, so somebody's put in the chat, how can I learn how to measure impact? Um, we do all of our training online. I, I would say come to the FSI. There are, I think NCBO does some, but that's not targeted at small organizations. That's kind of targeted much more broadly. Um, so my, um, you know, my, uh, my recommendation is to always blow our own trumpet with that. Um, so the way we develop our courses is um, we go out to um, charity leaders of small charities and uh, specialist consultants um, and they feed in and we bring all of this together and create a presentation that everybody's happy with and then we deliver the training from that um, and uh, it, it is really designed for small organizations who don't have the capacity to spend loads of time they you know big charities have teams of people to measure impact we can do that we've got maybe like half an hour a week or something like that maybe if we're lucky to consider this and so that's what our training does for you um there's also inspiring impact is a website um, that you can dip in and out of and they've got some good resources um again pitch slightly more to the advanced uh, level uh, if you're if you're a complete beginner um but very relevant still um, so there's plenty in there inspiring impact um, we had one in the chat, which was about, um, it wasn't really a question, but it was more about when accessing these kind of community pots, it can be quite hard when you're working kind of like UK wide or even beyond the UK because rare diseases are so rare. Can you still access those pots from the local community if you are kind of not just working in that area? And how can you kind of make your argument for like a different sense of community, I guess, to try and access that funding? Oh, no, I, well, I was just going to say it does come down to the impact side of things. So I think the fact that we've touched on impact first it is technically how many people you can prove that you work with within the UK or within a certain area space. But I mean, I think it's definitely worth inquiring. And particularly, like I said, with the community foundations, it could be, I mean, Beacon, we work nationally and we work internationally as well now. Um, we've received funding from our community foundation, for instance, over COVID. Um, to take some of our work online. Um, so it might not be funding that's accessible all the time, but there might be pots that are, are out there for you. So I think it's definitely worth looking into. Um, I don't know, David, what you your view is. Um, I would say it's usually worth a quick email or a phone call, but community organisations exist for community benefit. So if you're not benefiting that particular geographical community, then you might as well be looking elsewhere because even if you did send in an application, there's going to be more. I'm going to use the word valid. Now, that's not the right word to use, but there's going to be more valid people applying to that particular community, like a local youth work center, for example, that only does work in that community is going to beat you to it. So, um, so yeah, so it's definitely worth a phone call, but don't put any stock in it. That's what I would say. You're probably better exploring other opportunities. In the Q and A box, um, could you give your opinion of setting up charity lotteries? Um, if you're doing it right, it's a lot of red tape you've got to go through because you need, uh, you know, lotteries are gambling, um, and so there's various legal constraints you need to go through there. Um, if you're not doing it right, like our local PTA just did, and we had a great big bingo night, and that was just you know, let's just do it, um, then that's maybe a bit different. Um, I would say um, only put the work into it if you know it's going to be received well um, and only if the prizes for winning are going to be good. Um, there's a phenomenon in fundraising that's called death by raffle. Um, you know, when you go to a fundraising event and everybody's been really kind and generous and you've got 70 prizes to get through on the raffle. And by the time you get to prize number 20, most people are asleep on the floor. The same can be there for lottery uh, as well. Um, so you just need to be careful. There's, you know, a lot of established ones at the moment that are going to probably be a lot sexier and a lot bigger prizes than the ones that you could bring to the floor. So just um, be careful about that and go into it with, uh, do you do due diligence and the fundraising regulator's got loads of information about the legal hoops uh, that you need to go through to run 
uh, a lottery. Um, yeah. Anything to add on that, Laura? Um, no, I was just going to actually respond to one of the queries that was asked about um, national, um, national and international funders. Um, so obviously going back to that, working with um, people in the UK and beyond, um, we will be, we have got lists of trusts and foundations. Again, I, I highly recommend the DSC books. I know they are pricey, but they do have a lot of trusts and foundations um, within them that you, you know, a Google search is, is easy to do, but to have it all there in front of you is fantastic. Um, and we will be sending a list out following um, today, as I said earlier, um, and we'll try and highlight as many national um, funding trusts and foundations as we can. And I've also got a small list of ones that fund the UK based trusts and foundations, but they also fund internationally as well. So I will try and highlight as many as I can in the PDF following the webinar today. Um, so somebody asked, do you have advice for groups that are small and aren't a registered charity? We're all volunteers based around the country and find it hard to gain kudos. Oh, what a good question. Um, building your profile is a good place to start. Um, I think uh, people, if I'm, I'm, I'm assuming the need that you exist to meet is vital for somebody. Uh, you know, or a group of people. Um, so um, building up the kind of, uh, building up your mailing list, building up your um, social media um, followers, though a mailing list is going to be much more useful to you than a big Facebook list. Um, uh, that's where you want to go first of all. Um, also doing it in your own local area. I know your volunteers, you say you're spread around, but if, uh, all of your volunteers can maybe be equipped so they've got the confidence to speak about your organization in like an official way, like maybe give them uh, a, a official description of what you do, like a, an elevator pitch, that kind of thing. Um, that's really useful because word of mouth is actually the best kind of marketing. Um, Nike spends over a billion dollars every year on marketing. Um, they would sell their soul if they could crack word of mouth marketing. Um, and that is something actually that we can crack, especially if we're using uh, volunteers who have, you know, maybe seen the work firsthand or even our service users and their families who can champion our cause with the people they know. And um, so try and do what you can to increase your profile locally, but also equip folks um, to do it in their localities with their networks of folks as well. Give them that confidence to speak out and do that. That's where I would start. And then once you've got a decent bank of folks, you can then start exploring, right, how can you get involved with us to help with fundraising, to be a donor, to volunteer in any particular way that you might see fit. Maybe you can find someone with marketing experience and they can actually help you increase your profile even further. That, that kind of creative volunteering, if you're small and spread out, is quite useful. Laura, anything? Yeah, I would agree with David, and I'd go back a bit to what I said before. I think going out to do talks at places like Rotary, or going to like local WIs, um, local churches, even. Again, I know this is it's it's time time for everybody, but you'll often get donations from doing these kinds of um, talks about what you do, and through that, you're raising your profile as an organisation, and you only need somebody in that crowd to have a company that would want to you know, donate money to what you do, you know, it can very quickly um, develop into further donors and supporters um, for your organisation, even if you aren't registered. So I would agree entirely with David, and it's uh, all about that. And obviously, you can do that online as well. You know, you can do short, um, you can use your social media to sort of raise your profile that way, if you feel that way inclined. But um, in terms of accessing the local community that way, I still think that's beneficial even to people that work mm -hmm. uh, nationally and internationally um, because places like Rotary um, do, they work internationally and churches like to support international organisations as well. So it's a good place to start. Yeah, 100%. There's some other questions that have come through as well. We've struggled with funders understanding our ask. They often want more evidence from our community of the need for our services. So I guess we're not putting our argument across strongly enough. Any tips? Um, there might be a possibility that you're focusing too much on quantity and the quantities that you're dealing with rather than the quality. So if you can portray in a funding application uh, an individual and share their case study 
or maybe a few different individuals who kind of paste their case study together as if it was one individual, which is allowed as long as you said you've done it. Um, then that's going to maybe demonstrate the impact on more of an emotional basis than just on a pure number basis. I might be talking, you might not do that, but that's what I would do in that kind of situation where they don't understand the full extent is lean on the emotions um, of what's actually happening rather than maybe the hardcore facts alone. I mean, you need the facts, don't you? Um, but don't rely on those. Laura, you, what would you think? Um, I, I completely agree. I think um, getting case studies together, personal stories, photographs, um, <clears throat> not yeah. necessarily recording a podcast, but getting a you know a, an excerpt, um, you know whether it's video or sound of a patient that you work with talking about the impact the organisation has on on their life or on their family. Um, yeah, it's it is it's really hard. Evidence is so hard, and again, it goes back to that getting better at impact side of things. Um, but yeah, I'd, I'd agree with David. It's, it's not just like recording the numbers. It's kind of conveying the emotion that even though this is a small group, this is a massive impact on a lot of people. And again, I would really focus on not just the people that you're working with, the patients, but their wider networks, their family, you know, build, you can build impact further. You know, you, it hasn't just got to be the amount of patients that you're working with. It's the wider network of their their family networks and their partners and and everybody that's impacted um so i would really focus on that i've just seen your other comments that are coming through alison saying that you know you do include case studies and quotes and stats and um, there's a difference between including a case study and creating a story you might need to lean into the story more and if you need support with that then uh, go and see uh, if you can find somebody mm -hmm. particularly creative um to help you with that or there's oh, what's there's a website that's full of people who uh want to be story writers who would love to get their hands on this kind of thing so like five pound an hour dot com or something like fiber that. i think it's called fiber, fiber. It's called? yeah um, yeah genuinely even though these people know nothing about storytelling they can create something really cheaply that actually you go oh I can use that um, and change it and tailor it so it's more appropriate. So that might be an option. And I've, I've used that myself in my own fundraising as well um, to do that. So just because they don't have the specialist knowledge doesn't mean that they can't be of use for you. I had a question in the chat as well, David, that I just wanted to flag, which was about um, learning stewardship. So actually training on stewardship, whether that's something that people need to kind of like go and do a training on or whether there's lots of resources online to just kind of do best practice. Um, so the basics of, of stewardship is, are you intentionally just being really lovely to your people who are supporting you? I mean, that's it in a sentence. If you are going out strategically planning out how you are going to be lovely to folks, how are you going to make them feel valued and feel appreciated appropriately? Obviously, we don't want to be lavish in what we do. Um, but if you're doing that, then you're doing stewardship. If you want to put more boundaries and more kind of an official impetus behind it, well, you know what I'm going to say. We've got training on that. Um, so we've got training on it. Um, I think fundraising everywhere also do training on stewardship. It's not that popular because it's jargon. The word stewardship is jargon. Um, and so it's not ten, doesn't tend to be that popular, but it is vital. It's so important for charities, especially if you've got these developing or uh, blossoming relationships to invest in that so you can retain donors so i would say come to us um but put stewardship or retention might be something you want to pop into the search engine of your choice and um, to explore that a bit further but it's not as popular as like trusts and foundations fundraising for example David, I just wanted to highlight somebody has um, said about uh, FSI training and if you actually offer any free courses. I know NCVO have um, free webinars that you can access on their website, but do FSI have free resources that the groups can access? Um, if you um, want to sign up to us for £20 a month, there's loads of free resources there for you as part and package of that subscription. Um, we don't do free courses. And the reason why we do that is because if you run free courses, people don't show up. Um, and so at the moment, though, we are reviewing this, so maybe book your course sooner rather than later. Um, uh, an hour and a half is £15. And um, that goes down to £7.50 if you complete feedback, we refund it to you. Um, a full day's course is £50. But if 
that goes down to £25. Uh, we refund you half if you fill out our feedback. But that is being reviewed as we speak. So get your bookings in quickly um, because, uh, yeah, we need to ensure that our overheads and our fundraising uh, keeps us sustainable. Um, so that needs to be reviewed. So, um, so we don't offer free training, but it is affordable. Um, the way that we pitch it is... I just uh, so a final question, which was uh, from a bit earlier on. So, what do you think about selling merchandise as a source of income? I know at Beacon we've found this quite an expensive way to make uh, make money, but I wonder what your views were, David. Um, I totally agree with that. Um, it can seem quite attractive, but stuff's really expensive. Like you're talking like fifteen pound for a t-shirt, so you have to send it, sell it for twenty five quid. Who's got twenty five quid to spend on a t-shirt? Well, maybe you do if you're into fashion, as you can clearly see, I am not. Um, so um, if you've got the money up front to invest in it, then that's a possibility. There is a um, there is a kind of I don't know what to call it. There's a, a process called drop shipping, where you don't actually buy the stock up front. An external company like a printing house will have all this stock and then they'll just print your logo on it as an order comes through. Um, I've heard, I've never done it myself. Um, I've looked into it, but I've heard massively mixed reviews from it's brilliant, um, but it doesn't bring in a lot of money all the way through to just the headaches because the quality is not there because you're not in control of the issues around that. So drop shipping is an option, but you'll need to go and investigate that. I can't, I can't speak from experience. Uh, I can only speak uh, secondhand from that of others. But um, that's what I'm saying. I just wanted to add as well, like it doesn't necessarily, if you're talking about merchandise, like, it doesn't necessarily have to be a t-shirt. Like think about what gets people talking at like events or conferences. Could you give people stickers that are going to cost you a lot less with something really catchy on it, where if somebody saw you with that sticker in on your laptop in a coffee shop, they might ask you what that means or a badge that people can wear to conferences so they can say, I like your badge. Like, what is that? And then you can like start a conversation. Think about it's with it with any raising awareness kind of activity. Think about things that are going to have like the impact that you want that you can kind of trial and spend less money on, but are actually going to start a conversation if that's what you want them to do. Um, I mean, obviously, merch is used for different things. You might have somebody doing a marathon feel or something. I don't know. In which case, a T-shirt is really helpful. But just think about what, what resources you have. And we have tote bags that are really nicely designed. We get a lot of questions about those because obviously people can see and then they ask questions. So I think it's just like thinking who's go who are you going to give it to? What kind of things are they going to go to? What, what kind of impact is that going to have? On like if they're going somewhere where there's going to be lots of funders, they can wear something that's going to make people ask questions. That's just my like take on it. it. Doesn't need to be maybe yeah, like, no, the most extreme, have an impact. And then I put this in the chat as well. But at the end of March, we've got an online workshop which is all about formalizing your patient group as a charity. So the whole process of why you might want to be a charity, what that involves, and approaching operations and finances and things like that. Um, we think this is really useful if you are considering becoming a charity in the next year, the next two years, because we're going to run this now and probably a little bit later. But you won't be able to view the slides and recordings after that unless you've attended. So if you are thinking about it and you want to have that kind of training to go back to, then it's a really good one to sign up to. We'll have a full day of training on the second day from someone from MCVO as well, which we're really excited to have. So that will really um, have an expert opinion giving you what you need to know. Finally, just a massive thank you from me and everyone at Beacon. Thank you so much, David. That was really a really brilliant presentation. I hope everyone feels a little bit more prepared. I think it's difficult because it's still a little bit uncertain, but hopefully we've given you some tools to go forward with and I hope to see you at the next webinar as well.